The Gospel of Barnabas, edited and translated from the Italian manuscript in the Imperial Library at Vienna by Lonsdale and Laura Rog. And this book is from 1907, so we are in chapter 154, or verse 154, whatever it's supposed to be. The man, therefore, who hath honor and life and goods, when his possessions are stolen, the robber shall be hanged. That's going a bit too far for theft. Um, when his life is taken, the murderer shall be beheaded. And that is just, for God hath so commanded. Now, let me remind you that not all... Uh, religious people believe in beheading off of the battlefield. Islam certainly doesn't have that. And this is just, for God hath so commanded, but when a neighbor's honor is taken away, why is not the robber crucified? Are goods, forsooth, better than honor? Hath God, forsooth, commanded that he who taketh goods shall be punished, and he that taketh life with goods shall be punished? But he that taketh away honor shall go free? Surely not. For by reason of their murmuring, our fathers entered not into the land of promise, but only their children. And for this sin, the serpent slew about 70,000 of our people. As God liveth, in whose presence my soul standeth, he that stealeth honor is worthy of greater punishment than he that robbeth a man of goods and of life. And he that hearken to the murmur is likewise guilty. For the one receiveth Satan on his tongue, and the other in his ears. The Pharisees were consumed with rage at hearing this, because they were not able to condemn his speech. Then there drew nigh to Jesus a doctor, and said to him, Good master, tell me wherefore. God did not grant corn, you know, grain, and fruit to our fathers, knowing that they must needs fall. Surely he should have allowed them corn, or not have suffered men to see it. Jesus answered, Man, thou callest me good, but thou errest, for God alone is good. And much more dost thou err in asking why God hath not done according to thy brain. Yet I will answer thee all. I tell thee, then, that God, our Creator, in his working confirmeth, conformeth not himself to us. Wherefore it is not lawful for the creature to seek his own way and convenience. But, Rather, the honor of God is greater, in order that the creature may depend upon the Creator and not the Creator on the creature, as God liveth, in whose presence my soul standeth. If God had granted everything to man, man would not have known himself to be God's servant, and so he would have accounted himself Lord of Paradise, wherefore the Creator, who is blessed for evermore, forbade him the food in order that man might remain subject to him. And verily I say unto you, that whoso hath the light of his eyes clear, seeth everything clear, and draweth light, even out of darkness itself. But the blind doth not so. Wherefore I say that, if man had not sinned, neither I nor thou would have known the mercy of God and his righteousness. And if God had made man incapable of sin, he would have been equal to God in that matter. Wherefore the blessed God created man good and righteous, but free to do that which he pleaseth in regard to his own life and salvation or damnation. You know, accountability, right? The doctor was astounded when he heard this and departed in confusion. 155 of the forbidden fruit. Then the high priest called two old priests secretly and sent them to Jesus, who was gone out of the temple and was sitting in Solomon's porch, waiting to pray the midday prayer, 
and near him he had his disciples with a great multitude of people. The priests drew near to Jesus and said, Master, wherefore did man eat corn and fruit? Did God will that he should eat it or no? And this they said, tempting him, for if he said God willed it, they would answer, Why did he forbid it? And if he said God willed it not, they would say, Then man hath more power than God, since he worketh contrary to the will of God. Jesus answered, Their question is like a road over a mountain, which hath a precipice on the right hand and on the left, but I will walk in the middle. When they heard this, the priests were confront, uh, confounded, perceiving that he knew their heart. Then said Jesus, Every man for that he hath need, worketh everything for his own use. But God, who hath no need of anything, wrought according to his good pleasure. Wherefore, in creating man, he created him free in order that he might know that God had no need of him. Verbi gratia, as doth the king, who to display his riches, and in order that his slaves may love him more, giveth freedom to his slaves. God then created man free in order that he might love his creator much the more and might know his bounty. For although God is omnipotent and not having need of man, having created him by his omnipotence, he left him free by his bounty in such wise that he could not resist evil and do good. For although God had power to hinder sin, he would not contradict his own bounty, for God hath no contradiction, in order that his omnipotence and bounty, having wrought in man, he should not contradict sin in a man. I say in order that in man might work the mercy of God and his righteousness, and in token that I speak the truth, I tell you that the high priest hath sent you to tempt me, and this is the fruit of his priesthood. The old man and the old men departed and recounted all to the high priest, who said, This fellow hath the devil at his back, who recounteth everything to him, for he aspireth to the kingship of Israel. But God will see to that. And, well, the people who receive revelation and inspiration, for the rest of us, you know, the sort of prophet that there really is no more, um, they would get a message that just doesn't answer their own minds or be limited to um, what their own community is um, needing to be answered, but uh, something a little even broader than that. Well, I mean, the message is what their community needs, but you know what I mean. Um, 156. When he had made the midday prayer, you know, the early afternoon prayer, Jesus, as he went out of the temple, found one blind from his mother's womb, his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who sinned in this man, his father or his mother? And he was born blind. Jesus answered, Neither his father nor his mother sinned in him, but God created him so for a testimony of the gospel. And having called the blind man up to him, he spat on the ground and made clay and placed it upon the eyes of the blind man and said to him, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash thee. The blind man went, and having washed, received light. Whereupon, as he returned home, many who met him said, If this man were blind, I should say for certain that it was he who was wont to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple. Others said, It is he, but how hath he received light? And they accosted him, saying, Art thou the blind man that wast wont to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple? He answered, I am he, and wherefore? They said, Now how didst thou receive thy sight? He answered, A man made clay, spitting on the ground, and this clay he placed upon mine eyes, and said to me, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which is actually s some research, I forget where it was, um, so I can't really quote it, but supposedly it's the, most, the best mineral water in the region. Um, I went and washed, and now I see. Blessed be 
the God of Israel. When the man, born blind, was come again to the beautiful gate of the temple, all Jerusalem was filled with the matter, wherefore he was brought into the chief of the priests, you know, brought into his presence, who was conferring with the priests and the Pharisees against Jesus. The high priest asked him, saying, Man, wast thou born blind? Yea, he replied. Now give glory of God, said the high priest, and tell us what prophet hath appeared to thee in a dream, and given thee light. Was it our father Abraham, or Moses, the servant of God, or some other prophet? For others could not do such a thing. The man born blind replied, Neither Abraham, nor Moses, nor any prophet have I seen in a dream, and been healed by him. But as I sat at the gate of the temple, a man made me come near him, and having made clay of earth with his spittle, put some of that clay upon my eyes, and sent me to the pool of Siloam to wash, whereupon I went and washed me, and returned with the light of mine eyes. The high priest asked him the name of that man. The man born blind answered, He told me not his name, but a man who saw him called me, and said, Go and wash thee, as that man hath said, for he is Jesus, the Nazarene, a prophet, and an holy one of the God of Israel. Then said the high priest, Did he heal thee perchance today, that is the Sabbath? The blind man answered, Today he healed me. Said the high priest, Behold now! How that his fellow is a sinner, seeing he keepeth not the Sabbath. And, you know, if, if, if they're not doing this for work, I mean, thank you very much. It's not working on the Sabbath. 157. The blind man answered, Whether he is a sinner, I know not. But this I know, that whereas I was blind, he hath enlightened me. The Pharisees did not believe this, so that they said to the high priest, Send for his father and mother, for they that will tell us the truth. They sent therefore for the father and mother of the blind man. And when they were come, the high priest questioned them, saying, Is this man your son? They answered, He is verily our son. Then said the high priest, He hath said that he was born blind, and now he seeth. How hath this thing befallen? The father and mother of the uh, man born blind replied, Verily he was born blind, but how he may have received the light, we know not. He is of age, ask him, and he will tell you the truth. Whereupon they were dismissed, and the high priest said again to the man born blind, Give glory to God, and speak the truth. Now the father and mother of the blind man were afraid to speak, because a decree had gone forth from the Roman Senate, that no man might contend for Jesus, the prophet of the Jews. Under pain of death, this decree had the governor obtained. Wherefore they said, He is of age, ask him. The high priest then said to the man born blind, Give glory to God and speak the truth, for we know this man whom thou sayest to have healed thee, that he is a sinner. The man born blind answered, Whether he be a sinner? I know not, but this I know, that I saw not, and he hath enlightened me. Of a surety from the beginning of the world, at this hour, there hath never yet been enlightened one who was born blind, and God would not hearken to sinners. Well, let's not gospel prosperity of us, too. Um, it's not entirely what we earn you know, said the Pharisees. Now what did he when he enlightened thee? Then the man born blind marveled at their unbelief and said, I have told you, and wherefore ask ye me again, would ye also become his disciples? The high priest then reviled him, saying, Thou wast altogether born in sin, and wouldst thou teach us? Begone, and become thou disciple of such a man. Regardless of what the case of the parents are, no one is born a sinner. Begone, and become thou disciple of such a man, for we are disciples of Moses, and we know that God hath spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we know not whence he is. 
and they cast him out of the synagogue and temple, forbidding him to make prayer with the clean among Israel. Now, people of all groups are pulling this garbage nowadays that um, unless there's some safety issue because the person's like violent or uh, incontinent and making a mess or something, um, casting people out of places of worship it's just it's not right. Let them let them join in what's mutually to be done, right? 158. The man born blind went to find Jesus, who comforted him, saying, At no time hast thou been so blessed as thou art now, for thou art blessed of our God, who spake through David, our father and his prophet, against the friends of the world, saying, They curse, and I bless. And by Micah the prophet he said, I curse your blessing, for earth is not so contrary to air, water, to fire, light to darkness, cold to heat, or love to hate, as is the will that God hath contrary to the will of the world. The disciples accordingly asked him, saying, Lord, great are thy words. Tell us, therefore, the meaning, for as yet we understand not. Jesus answered, When ye shall know the world, ye shall see that I have spoken the truth, and so shall ye know the truth in every prophet. Know ye then that there be three kinds of worlds, comprehended in a single name. One standeth for the heavens and the earth, with water, air, and fire, and all the things that are inferior to man. Now this world and all things followeth the will of God, for as saith David the prophet of God, God hath given them a precept which they transgress not. The second standeth for all men, even as the house of such an one standeth not for the walls, but for the family. Now this world again loveth God, because by nature they long after God, Forasmuch as according to nature every one longeth after God, even though they err in seeking God. And know ye, wherefore, all long after God, because they long after every one an infinite good, without any evil, and this is God alone. Therefore, the merciful God hath sent his prophets to this world for its salvation. The third world is men's fallen condition of sinning, wherefore, which hath transformed itself into a law contrary to God, the creator of the world, this maketh man become like unto the demons, God's enemies. And this world our God hateth so sore that if the prophets had loved this world, what think ye? Assuredly God would have taken from them their prophecy. And what shall I say? As God liveth, in whose presence my soul standeth, and the messenger of God shall come to the world, if he should conceive love towards this evil world, assuredly God would take away from him all that he gave him when he created him and would make him reprobate so greatly is God contrary to this world. And, you know, we, you know, we look, we look at these prophets are up to these prophets, and but they weren't just forgiven forever or something. They were forgiven because it was known what they would um, continue to live through or live as. Right. One hundred fifty-nine. The disciples answered, "O Master, exceedingly great are thy words. Therefore, have mercy upon us, for we understand them not." Said Jesus. Think ye perchance that God hath created his messenger to be a rival, who should feign to make himself equal with God? Assuredly not, but rather as his good slave, who should not will that which his Lord willeth not. Ye are not able to understand this, because... Ye know not what a thing is sin. Wherefore, hearken unto my words. Verily, verily, I say unto you, sin cannot arise in man, save a contradiction of God, seeing that only is sin which God willeth not, insomuch that all God willeth is most alien from sin. And, you know, we had the mention in the previous chapter of the, of the demons, Demons aren't created. Demons are individuals that are choosing to be a certain sort. 
you know, accordingly, if our high priests and priests, uh, if our high priest and priests with the Pharisees persecuted me because the people of Israel hath called me God, they would be doing a thing pleasing to God, and God would reward them. But because they have persecuted me for a contrary reason, since they will not have me say the truth, how they have contaminated the book of Moses and that of David, prophets and friends of God by their traditions, and therefore hate me and desire my death. Therefore God hath them an abomination. Tell me, Moses slew men, and Ahab slew men. Is this in each case murder? Assuredly not. For Moses slew the men to destroy idolatry and to preserve the worship of the true God. Well, you can defend your nation, but, you know, um, that sort of thing needs a little bit of a context reference, right? But Ahab slew the men to destroy the worship of the true God and to preserve idolatry. Wherefore, to Moses, the slaying of men was converted into sacrifice, while to Ahab it was converted into sacrilege, insomuch that one and the same work produced these two contrary effects, as God liveth, in whose presence my soul standeth. If Satan had spoken to the angels in order to see how they loved God, they would not have been rejected of God, but because he sought to turn them away from God, therefore is he reprobate. Then answered he who writeth, How then is to be understood that which is said in Micaiah the prophet concerning the lie which God ordained to be spoken by the mouth of false prophets, as is written in the book of the kings of Israel? Jesus answered, O Barnabas, recite briefly all that befell, that we may see the truth clearly. 160. Then said he who writeth, Daniel the prophet, describing the history of the kings of Israel and their tyrants, writeth thus, The king of Israel joined himself with the king of Judah to fight against the sons of Belial, that is, reprobates, who were the Ammonites. And aren't the Ammonites ones said to worship Melech Taos? Um, now, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and Ahab, king of Israel, being seated both on a throne in Samaria, there stood before them four hundred false prophets who said to the king of Israel, Go up against the Ammonites, for God will give them into thy hands, and thou shalt scatter Ammon. Then said Jehoshaphat, is there here any prophet of the God of our fathers? Ahab answered, There is only one, and he is evil, for he always predicteth evil concerning me, and him I hold in prison. And this he said to wit, There is only one, because as many as were found have been slain by the decree of Ahab, so that the prophets, even as thou hast said, O master, were fled to the mountain tops, where men dwelt not. Then said Jehoshaphat, Send for him here, and let us see what he saith. Ahab therefore commanded that Micaiah be sent for thither, who came with fetters on his feet, and his face bewildered like a man that liveth between life and death. Ahab asked him, saying, Speak, Micaiah, in the name of God. Shall we go up against the Ammonites? Will God give their cities into our hands? Micaiah answered, Go up, go up. For prosperously shalt thou go up, and still more prosperously come down. Then the false prophets praised Micaiah as a true prophet of God, and broke off the fetters from his feet. Jehoshaphat, who feared our God, and had never bowed his knees before the idols, said, asking Micaiah, saying, For the love of the God of our fathers, speak the truth. As thou hast seen the issue of this war, Micaiah answered, O Jehoshaphat, I fear thy face, wherefore I tell thee that I have seen the people of Israel as sheep without a shepherd. And Ahab, smiling, said Jehoshaphat to Jehoshaphat, I told thee that this fellow predicteth only evil, but thou didst not believe it. Then 
said they both. Now how knowest thou this, O Micaiah? Micaiah answered, Methought there assembled a council of the angels in the presence of God, and I heard God say thus, Who will deceive Ahab, that he may go up against Ammon and be slain? Whereupon one said, One thing, and another said another. Then came an angel and said, Lord, I will fight against Ahab, and will go to his false prophets, and will put the lie in their mouth. And so shall he go up and be slain. After hearing this, God said, Now go, and do so, for thou shalt prevail. Then were the false prophets enraged, and their chief smote Micaiah's cheek, saying, O reprobate of God, when did the angel of truth depart from us and come to thee? Tell us when came to us the angel that brought the lie. Micaiah answered, Thou shalt know when thou shalt flee from house to house for fear of being slain, having deceived thy king. Then Ahab was wroth and said, Seize Micaiah and the fetters which he had upon his feet place on his neck and keep him on barley bread and water until my return. For now I know not what death I would inflict on him. They went up then, and according to the word of Micaiah, the matter befell. For the king of the Ammonites said to his servants, See that ye fight not against the king of Judah, nor against the princes of Israel, but slay the king of Israel, Ahab mine enemy. Then said Jesus, Stop there, Barnabas, for it is enough for our purpose. 161. Have ye heard all, said Jesus? The disciples answered, Yea, Lord. Whereupon Jesus said, Lying is indeed a sin, but murder is greater, because the lie is a sin that appertaineth to him that speaketh. But the murder, while it appertaineth to him that committeth it, is such that destroyeth also the dearest thing that God hath here upon earth, that is man. And lying can be remedied by saying, The contrary of that which hath been said, whereas murder hath no remedy, seeing that it is not possible to give life again to the dead. Tell me then, did Moses the servant of God sin in slaying all whom he slew? The disciples answered, God forbid, and God forbid that Moses should have sinned in obeying God who commanded him. Then said Jesus, and I say, God forbid that angel should have sinned who deceived Ahab's false prophets with the lie. For even as God receiveth the slaughter of men as sacrifice, so received he the lie for praise. Verily, verily, I say unto you that even as the child erreth which causeth its shoes to be made by the measure of a giant, even so erreth he who would subject God to the law, as he himself, as man, is subject to the law. When, therefore, ye shall believe that, only to be sin which God willeth not, ye will find the truth, even as I have told you. Wherefore, because God is not composite nor changeable, so also is he unable to will and not will a single thing. For so would he have contradiction in himself, and consequently pain, and would not be infinitely blessed. Philip answered, But how is that saying of the prophet Amos to be understood, that there is not evil in the city that God hath not done? Jesus answered, Now here see, Philip, how great is the danger of resting in the letter, as do the Pharisees, who have invented for themselves the predestination of God and the elect, in such wise that they come and say, in fact, that God is unrighteous, a deceiver, and a liar, and a hater of judgment, which shall fall upon them. Wherefore, I say that here Amos the prophet of God speaketh of the evil which the world calleth evil, for if he had used the language of the righteous, he would not have been understood by the world. For all tribulations are well, either for that they purge the evil that we have done, or are well because they restrain us from doing evil, or are well because they make a man to know the condition of this life, in order that we may love and long for life eternal. Accordingly, he had the prophet Amos say, There is no good in the city but what God hath wrought it. He had given occasion for the despair to the afflicted, as they beheld themselves in tribulation and sinners living in prosperity. And what is worse, many believing Satan to have had such sovereignty over man, 
but had feared Satan and done him service, so as not to suffer tribulation, Amos therefore did as doth the Roman interpreter, who considereth not his words, as one speaking in the presence of the high priest, but considereth the will and the business of the Jew, that knoweth not to speak the Hebrew tongue. And so it's, it's, it's essential that we learn of the language of the scripture of our age. And Hebrew is, you know, of course, a new name for Aramaic or Syriac or Aramea, as it was written during the time of who we call Jesus. But 162, if Amos had said, there is no good in the city but what God hath done it, as God liveth, in whose presence my soul standeth, he would have made a grievous error, for the world holdeth not for good aught save the iniquities and sins that are done in the way of vanity, whereupon men would have wrought much more iniquitously, believing that there be not any sin or wickedness which God hath not done, adhering whereof the earth trembleth. And when Jesus had said this straight away, there arose a great earthquake, insomuch that every one fell as dead. Jesus raised them up, saying, Now see if I have told you the truth. Let this then suffice you, that Amos, when he said that God hath done evil in the city, talking with the world, spake of tribulations which sinners alone call evil. Now, you know, this disbelievers speak of natural evil. So that difficulty is what's meant. Let us come now to predestination, of which ye desire to know, and whereof I will speak to you near the Jordan on the other side tomorrow, if God will. So our lifespan is preordained. How good and bad we're going to be, our provision, where we're going to go. But when it comes to all those things, isn't there um, free will involved in affecting them? 